Okay, so welcome everyone to the Humane Philosophy Project Ian Ramsey Center seminar. Uh, this is an ongoing seminar series, as many of you know, organized by the Humane Philosophy Project and the Ian Ramsey Center for Science and Religion with support from the Institute of Philosophy at the University of Warsaw uh, and hosted by Blackfriars Hall University of Oxford. Uh, I'll pass over to my colleague Mikwai Sofkowski Roda to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Ralph. Um, it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce you to you this evening Professor Agatha Billy Kropson, um, who uh, teaches um, at the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology at the Polish Academy of Sciences, but also uh, at the Faculty of Theology uh, at the um, Nottingham University, uh, but also uh, guest lectures at many other institutions and is a member of uh, an illustrious academic institution, the Collegium Invisibile in Poland. Um, Professor Agata Billy Kropson's interests include subjectivity, Jewish philosophy, um, and the influences of psychoanalytic, uh, the psychoanalytic tradition and the romantic thought on philosophy. Uh, and she has published widely um, in all these areas. Um, and in fact, tonight she's going to talk to us. Um, uh, her, her talk has a very intriguing title, uh, The Finite and the Infinite. Um, the uh, infinite and the finite. The infinite and the finite. Human, <laughs> human life as a living contradiction in the Hegel, uh, 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 Rosenzweig and... Uh, I had to drop Freud, I'm afraid. You've dropped that Freud. Be a okay, so, so without much. Freud. So it's, it's mostly Hegel and Rosenzweig. Well, Mostly a special Hegel and emphasis paid on Rosenzweig, yes. Ah, but I was going to say that tonight's talk is also going to be at the cross-section uh, of uh, psychoanalysis and the influence of the Romantic movement on philosophy. So we'll drop the uh, psychoanalysis and stay with the Romantic movement. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very ready to discuss Freud in the in question the question answer. session. So the yes, intersection will take place in the question session. So please give a very, very warm welcome to uh, Professor Gilly Kropson. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you very much for the invitation. As I said, I had to shrink the, uh, shrink the title a little bit and drop Freud. So uh, the title is now The Infinite in the Finite Life as a Living Contradiction in Hegel and Rosenzweig. Uh, and it has a motto from Fram Ros Franz Rosenzweig's Understanding the Sick and the Healthy, which says, Life is not eternal life. It flows from birth towards death. The main theme of my lecture is finite life. There is yet nothing original in this choice. The finite life constitutes a staple subject of post-Heideggerian philosophy, which routinely concentrates on the notion of finitude, endlichkeit, and opposes it to the ontotheological concept of infinity, represented by a being which cannot stop existing, perennial, eternal, immortal, and because of that immune to contingent fate. I am not going to criticize this development and revert to the ontological idea of infinity secured in the sacred image of the immortal life. But I also do not want to give up on infinity so completely. Rather, and this is my claim to originality, I would like to see infinity transposed so it can become an indispensable moment of the finite life. On the first glance, this seems like a paradox, a living contradiction indeed, but then one soon realizes that the best modern philosophy has to offer has been circling precisely around these problematics. Hegel, Kierkegaard, Rosenzweig, Freud, to name just a few modern giants, all try to think about the finitude in a way which does not automatically exclude infinity. Yet the current climate, which attempts to think finitude to the end, literally to exhaustion, does not take well, paradoxa. It rather explores instead all traditional attributes of things finite. Limitation, conditioning, 
reduction and most of all death. All that which Hegel named collectively with the term negativity, signifying the very sum of finitude perceived in pejorative contrast to the infinite, the only one worth to be called proper being. Despite, despite the present efforts of the whole post-Heideggerian line, which attempt to bestow finite life with a new glory, the result is far from satisfying. The life which ends stubbornly refers to its end as the life destined to die, life spent under the dark sun of Thanatos. Instead of celebrating the regained autonomy of the finite world, released from the diminishing and oppressive juxtaposition with the infinite, we still tarry with the negative. But is it possible, possible at all to think about our finitude differently, not under the auspices of death, the end, the goal, the final destiny, the ultimate verdict? The whole stake of such project would mean to try to think finitude positively, that is, to evoke the famous image of Levinas shot through by the arrow of infinity, but unlike in Levinas, not at all broken by it. This image of life as a living contradiction, torn between desire for immortality and the verdict of death, but not necessarily torn apart, rather spurned and mobilized by its inner paradox, appears already in Hegel. For Hegel, life is a true point of departure for the dialectic, dialectical speculative thinking, the goal of which is precisely the solution of this original contradiction, or in Hegel's own words, the reconciliation of the infinite and the finite. But as long as life is an existing and abiding, not yet reconciled contradiction, its main manifestation is pain. So says Hegel in The Science of Logic. Pain is the prerogative of living natures. Because they are the existent notion, they are an actuality of infinite power, such that they are within themselves the negativity of themselves, that is, their negativity is for them, and that they maintain themselves in their otherness. It is said that contradiction is unthinkable, but in fact, in the pain of a living being, it is an actual existence. Hegel no, no, Hegel's notion of life as a living contradiction stands in glaring opposition to the late modern biopolitical notion of life as a more or less smooth and uneventful cycle of becoming and perishing, birth and death, as it would seem completely at ease with the condition of finitude. Pain is a prerogative, which also means privilege. It is not to be taken away in the anesthetic pursuit of a painless life, which, in biopolitical terms, became a hardly disputed synonym of happiness. This does not mean, however, that such designation of pain as the symptom of the living contradiction leads to the conservative affirmation of the hardships of life. Quite to the contrary, though pain may not be an easily sublatable disappearing moment, as Hegel says, it is nonetheless the sign which, very much like in the psychoanalytic body language, cannot be semantically ignored. In his concept of pain as a sign, Hegel pioneers the Freudian psychoanalytic anti-anesthetic approach which attempts to solve the riddle of human life by deciphering its unique idiom of suffering. Life which suffers because of its unfulfilled dream of more life is a human life in pain. The whole dialectics derives precisely from this recognition then 
that lends it an immediate existential urgency. Now, in my lecture, I would like to focus mostly on Rosenzweig, whose Neues Denken, the project of new thinking, can be seen as both anticipating and already reacting to this new development. Despite the depressive climate of the overwhelming finitude and the Heideggerian Sein zum Tode being unto death, Rosenzweig wants to remain faithful to the Hegelian idea of the living contradiction and resist solving it into a simple, flat, physiological process of coming in and out of existence. The most striking feature of this project, the way I see it, is that it wants to maintain the messianic imperative of the maximalization of existence, but no longer projected towards the infinite life after death, but fulfilled within the indefinite life before death. Rosenzweig thus proposes a unique philosophy of life both finite and indefinite, fulfilling itself in the infinite richness and openness to neighborly love, which makes no exceptions, paces through the whole world and takes it all, that is, all things it encounters nearby. Although often seen as a parallel to Heidegger's analytics of design, Rosenzweig's new thinking is actually the very opposite. Despite many deceptively similar formulations which also portray life as issuing towards death, it is uniquely concerned with the question that never much bothered Heidegger, namely, is life before death possible? All of Rosenzweig's efforts go into what he saw as squaring the circle the paradox bequeathed to late modernity by the crisis of philosophical idealism, which for him coincided with the shocking and scandalous emergence of the thinker named Arthur Schopenhauer. The first one in the long line of Western philosophers to declare human li that human life is finite and for that very reason totally and irreparably meaningless. The paradox, therefore, consists in the defense of life as finite and as life, not the shadow of death which informs and paralyzes the vital forces at the moment of their inception, but the full healthy life which simultaneously affirms itself as a separate category and recognizes, as Rosenzweig calls it, sovereignty of death. Rosenzweig's little book, The Understanding of Sick and the Healthy, attempts to teach life the lesson of maintaining itself in the paradox, in the contradiction, without solving or sublating it. I quote, By teaching man to live again, we have taught him to move towards death. We have taught him to live, though each step he takes brings him closer to death. There is no remedy for death, not even health. A healthy man, however, has the strength to continue towards the grave. The sick man invokes death and lets himself be carried away in mortal fear. In health, even death comes at the proper time. All appearances to the contrary, this is not Heidegger's being unto death. The little, yet the size of difference lies in the emphasis Rosenzweig puts on the active resistance of life against death's chilling influence on it. On the way the healthy subject moves or continues towards death, despite the constant danger of the paralysis of artificial death or the death in life, which stops him from moving on. Despite death's declared sovereignty, the life, which eventually succumbs to death, is not to learn anything from his absolute master. 
It is to accept its overruling presence, but not to allow itself to be overwhelmed by it. Accept the verdict, but not the authority. Take on the sentence, but not the wisdom which underlies it. Death may thus be an end, even goal, but it is pictured here as a limit which is not invited into the center of life, in meat and disturbance, but delegated as a power outside, only to intervene in its own proper time. Whereas, in Heidegger's original construction of being towards death, death penetrates into the very midst of design. It is the very motor of its self-transcending existence, the teacher of the heroic decision-making, which is as groundless, abyssal, and pervaded by nothingness as death itself. Here, death is indeed a telos of life, which runs its course according to the lofty submission, as Jean-Luc Nancy calls it aptly, sublime self-offering. Death is led in the middle of life as its thanatic guide, either in the existential function of a catalyst, heroic decision, or later, after the Heidegger's Keire, the turn, as the demobilizing event horizon, which works through the Gelassenheit, the quietistic anti-force of appeasement. None of it figures in Rosenzweig's project of new thinking, which wants to give death its proper due, but absolutely nothing more. It wants to acknowledge the fact of the finite life without overestimating its impact on the process of living. Finding the right measure, the right ratio in death's relationship with life is the sole purpose here. This alone makes Rosenzweig's endeavor opposite to Heidegger's one, which, from the perspective of Neues Denken, may indeed be characterized as a systematic overestimation of death. In the series of lectures composed in 1935 and then edited under the title Introduction to Metaphysics, Heidegger presents death as the ultimate aporia, drawing on the original Greek meaning of the word as no way out, no exit, the unsurpassable blocking of the passage. Man who likes to see himself as pantoporos, that is, the most resourceful creature, which, I quote, begets in itself its own unessence, the versatility feel Wendigkeit of many twists and turns, deep down appears to be, in fact, aporos, a priori blocked and doomed to failure, says Heidegger. There is only one thing against which all violence doing directly shatters, that is death. It is an end beyond all completion, a limit beyond all limits. Here there is no breaking forth and breaking up, no capturing and subjugating. But this uncanny thing, which sets us simply and suddenly out from everything homely once and for all, is not a special event that must also be mentioned among others, because it too ultimately does occur. The human being has no way out in the face of death, not only when it is time to die, but constantly and essentially. Insofar as humans are, they stand in the no exit of death. Okay, for Rosenzweig, just like for Heidegger, who, human life has indeed no pre-established essence and as such constitutes an open process. The latter, Heidegger, in the introduction to metaphysics, states firmly that the determination of the essence of the human being is never an answer, but is essentially a question. Yet, the two thinkers played out very differently. Heidegger's nolens volens gravitates towards the closure, 
the death certainty and the death center of death, which gradually substitutes for the missing essence of the sign. Signs denken, thinking about being, and todes denken, thinking about death, become less and less distinguishable synonyms. It is after all death which tears away man from the familiar homeliness of the world of seeming and throws him in the nearness of being the most uncanny, unheimlich of all thoughts. It is the annihilating nicht then the power of death which can put man in touch with the nichts the signs, the nothing of being, which underlines the realm of phenomenal beings. Death, therefore, becomes the vehicle of the highest spiritual transport which defines the destiny of human design. A diagnosis not very far, in fact, from the original thanatic thought of Hegel, who in the preface to Phenomenology of Spirit depicts spirit as the power capable to abide in death and to look it straight in the face. Heidegger says, the human being has no way out in the face of death, not only when it is time to die, but constantly and essentially. And this, for Rosenzweig, is precisely the sickness, sickness unto death, which pushes death into the very center of human life as its defining moment, giving it its missing constancy and essence. In Heidegger, no being, no positive content can ever feel the gap of nothingness which constitutes human being and thus offer an answer to its glaring questioning abyss. This nothing can only be matched by the nothing of death which helps to disclose the abyssal nothing of being. But this is exactly what Rosenzweig wants to avoid. While Heidegger's thinking is still old-fashionedly vertical and static, resting with the hypostatic nothing beneath the clam clamor of beings, Rosenzweig's new thinking tests new post-metaphysical possibilities contained in the very idea of the story, which is moving through the surface of things, horizontal, nominalistic, involving no pre-established a priori. The role of the story is not to allow the nothing which gives human life its questioning and questionable non-essential character to grow and congeal into some hypostatic care for being in general, but keeps it on the level criticized by Heidegger as non-authentic. Precisely the small, I quote, unessence, the versatility of many twists and turns. Rosenzweig explores the essential nichts, nothingness of human life in the form of a horizontal narrative which evolves only thanks to its indefiniteness. By refusing to turn the singular life into something easily definable, he lets it assume a meandering structure containing many peripeteias, the resourceful twists and turns indeed, which postpone the final verdict. Here, the so-called Erzählen des Sprachdenken, the narrative speech thinking, becomes a synonym of Lebensdenken, life thinking. As in Heidegger, the human life emerges here as open, indefinite, with no pre-given essence, but all this negative characteristic merely serves as the canvas for a new narrative philosophy, the new drama of time and its unpredictability, which can only evolve in the living dialogue between human being and his neighbors. There is thus a clear parallel between Rosenzweig's interest in the narrative form and Walter Benjamin's essay, Storyteller, which mentions Scheherazade's Thousand and One Tales as the paradigmatic case of the storytelling practice, which not only postpones, but also complicates the death sentence. 
Here also the main function of the story is the delay and the ferment which makes room for the living in predictability despite the inevitable finale in the death assuredness of death. The complication of this dead simple sentence consists in the way in which the story includes the finale on its own rights and terms and appropriates it to such extent that it indeed comes in the proper time so that the singular life may end up by, as Freud used to call it, dying in its own fashion. When commenting on affinities and divergences between Rosens, Rosenzweig and Heidegger, who are more or less contemporary, Karl Levitt, who actually argues that they have much more in common than I want to claim, spots one crucial difference. While they both emphasize the Endlichkeit, finitude of human life, Heidegger dissolves it all in the immanent temporality offering no resistance to transience, while Rosenzweig insists on the infinite moment, the perfect fulfillment of life which truly and finally comes to be and thus eternalizes itself. True, but this eternal completion is possible only on the grounds of the more fundamental form of infinity which plays itself out in human life, despite its finitude. We may call it indefinity, or even better, infinitiveness, deriving from the grammatical concept of the infinite, which alludes to the potentially infinite potentiality of uses into which the verb may be put. Infinitiveness as the peculiar condition of human life which refuses to be concrete something without actually slipping into any abstract nothing. Again, Rosenzweig. We must daringly seize upon a life which is content to be an in-between state, merely a transition from one thing to another. Let us reject the ever-present answer, life is, man is, and let us become part of the onward-moving life of man. Here life is not, it simply occurs. This is an outright apology of the non-essential life, something very adversarial to Heidegger, who called it a wrong type of unessence, superficial and resourceful as Odysseus, to whom this phrase originally refers, and as such, incapable to plunge metaphysically into the abysses of being. But also adversarial to Georg Lukács, whose famous essay, Metaphysics of Tragedy, Rosenzweig actually had read, unlike Heidegger. He only knew some small fragments of Heidegger, but he never actually read Being and Time. In this essay, Lukács' Metaphysics of Tragedy, devoted to the philosophical essence of tragedy and published in 1914, Lukács, at the time still a doctoral student of Georg Simmel, attempts to get out from the morasses of German Leibniz philosophy, thanks to the transport, Auschwung, offered by the death of the tragic hero. Unlike life, which is a chaotic anarchy of light and darkness that can never be lived to the end and always evades any form, death is a chisel. It carves life into a statuesque stony structure by giving it a definite character. And now a fragment from Metaphysics of Tragedy which is actually very precursorial to Heidegger's being and time. Life is an anarchy of light and dark. Nothing is ever completely fulfilled in life. Nothing ever quite ends. New confusing voices always mingle with the chorus of those that have been heard before. Everything flows, everything merges into another thing, and the mixture is uncontrolled and impure. 
everything is destroyed, everything is smashed, nothing ever flowers into real life. Real life is always unreal, always impossible, in the midst of empirical life. But suddenly there is a gleam, a lightning that illuminates the banal paths of empirical life, something disturbing and seductive, dangerous and surprising. The accident, the great moment, the miracle, an enrichment and a confusion. It cannot last. No one would be able to bear it. No one could live at such heights, at the height of their own life and their own ultimate possibilities. One has to fall back into numbness. One has to deny life in order to live. Now, look at Jan Heidegger go hand in hand. They both want to get out from the stream of life in which being and seeming, truth and mere appearance, clarity and dispersion are forever intertwined and there is no way out of this ambivalence apart from what at first seemed like a no way out, a total blockage, an aporia, death, the tanatic miracle. Just like Heidegger wishes for the forces of the uncanny and incidental to break through the covers of the ordinary into the truth of being, Lukács wants to step out from the Lebensstrom, the stream of life, in order to experience the real, which is denied to him in the normal course of life. And this is precisely the wrong kind of wonder Rosenzweig warns us against at the beginning of his little book. The deadly paralysis which imagines that it steps beyond the flow of life into something transcendent and more real, but in fact it only stops, becomes idly arrested without discovering anything outside life. Maurice Blanchot, who starring with Heidegger can be to some extent at least compared to Rosenzweig's wrestling with Lukács, would pun it as pas au-delà, a non-step beyond, which is held in check by the arrêt de mort, the arrest sentence of death. In order to avoid this deadly miracle, the life must agree to be the thing of unessence, a flow without form, a meandering story with many twists and turns. Uh, I quote, a life which is content to be an in-between state, merely a transition from one thing to another. Now we remember from the star, the star of redemption, which is Rosenzweig's main book, that the seemingly derogatory characteristic to be in transition was given to what Rosenzweig regards as the highest and most valuable content of the revelation, that is, love. For it is love which goes from one way neighbor to another and paces restlessly the whole world in the constant transition, oblivious to its own essence and not at all interested in the centering self-reflection. It is love which, in Goethe's words, connects all without creating a hypostatic sense of allheit, totality, itself indefinite, and because of that infinitely open to embrace each being one after another, nominally and nominalistically, just like God himself, who knows every creature by name as a unique singularity. For Rosenzweig, therefore, the life in transition, life in between, does not indicate dispersion, impurity or incompleteness as it does for Lukács or Heidegger. It is inessential, so it can feel itself with intense neighborly relations. It is lacking essence, so it can be full of love. And love's manner of operating thanks to which love attaches itself to all the neighbors, is language. For, as Rosenzweig says, it is language which erects the visible bridge from man to that which is not man to the other. 
If life means love, then love means also living speech, naming, addressing, calling, that is, cultivating the attachment. Rosenzweig says in The Star of Redemption, the bond of the consummate and redemptive bonding of men and the world is to begin with neighbor, and even more only the neighbor, the well nigh nighest. Love glides from one bearer to the other, the next one, from one neighbor to the next neighbor. It is not satisfied until it has paced off the whole orbit of creation. It leaves its traces everywhere in its migration by providing the plural of things everywhere with the sign of singularity. But this process of gliding from one bearer to another, this gradual pacing off the whole orbit of creation, cannot happen all at once. For no shortcuts are allowed here. No jumps to general categories that would circumvent the singularity of every concrete neighbor which the Rosenzweigian love encounters. Love is thus a lifelong, continuous and always incomplete process of solving the living contradiction between the infinite and the finite where the endlessly open, transitional and relational nature of love offers a synthesis in the form of infinity, not the infinity of the essence which human life does not possess and can never possess, but the infinity of non-essence, a virtual non-being that can attach itself to and thus become everything. We could just sum up the difference between Rosenzweig and Heidegger by evoking the biblical line, which is also the guiding motif of the Star of Redemption. Azar hamavet ahava, love strong as death. Not so much eternity versus temporality, but rather infinity transposed into the indefinity of love versus absolute finitude closed by the verdict of death. Both these visions of life, Heidegger's and Rosenzweig's, are finite, but only the Rosenzweigian one makes room for the immanent transfiguration of the infinite, which thoroughly transforms the very idea of finitude, taking it out from the realm of the sheer death-doomed negativity. Here, human being is not a death-bound nothing, collapsing into the fake essence of his or her nothingness, but a lively bundle of indefinite energy which easily flows into the energies of the world. The Büchlein, the little book, shows that the true objective of new thinking is another finitude marked not by death, but by love, constantly tarring with the most challenging existential outcome of the crisis of philosophical idealism, the rediscovery of the finite life. This event still reverberates through the late modernity and continues to transform all the concepts of philosophical thought, subject, life, soul, by depriving them of their infinite dimension. The new thinking simultaneously accepts the verdict of human finitude and rejects the total castration of infinity. But what is probably most important and also most intriguing, it also teaches the proper nature of religious interest. For Rosenzweig, religion is not about life after death. It is all about life before death, however the religious traditions used to call it, true, higher, more intense life, which wills itself and confirms itself in the finite condition against the sentence of death. Thank you.
Ricky, thank you very much for that. Uh, we'll move over to questions now. Um, do raise your hand and wait for the microphone to come to you before you uh, ask a question. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and make sure you turn it on as well, otherwise it will be no use at all. <laughs> okay, well, uh, since I don't see any questions immediately, I, I'll start by asking one which might be a slightly uh, uh, foolish question, not being grounded too much in the areas you spoke on, although it was extremely interesting. You mentioned earlier on in the talk uh, uh, what I understood to be an opposition between what you called uh, the bio biopolitical uh, view of life and death as a cycle, but not necessarily one that we're uncomfortable with. Uh, and then the speakers you were discussing. I was just wondering if you could uh, uh, say something more about what the biopolitical view is, where that comes from, and where, where it becomes problematic. Uh, well, thank you for the question. I could only uh, suggest it here, that what I'm trying to do in my project, which is called, indeed, Another Finitude, and uh, for which I think Rosenzweig is the guiding uh, star, uh, in my project, I'm trying to oppose my understanding of the finite life uh, to the biopolitical one. Right? The biopolitical one is a kind of a slogan, but it more or less covers the uh, a kind of a current attitude towards the finitude of human life, uh, which treats it more or less as a smooth, uneventful, physiological cycle, of coming in and out of existence. That is, we're getting born, uh, we evolve, we eventually get sick and die. Right? And as Alexandre Kozhev, who is the uh, um, precursor and the founding father of the biological pa paradigm in the 20th century philosophy, uh, used to say, uh, this is a sign of our maturity, also intellectual maturity, that we are at ease with the verdict of death. So basically we accept not just a finite life as, the, uh, as issuing inevitably towards death, but we also accept a kind of a, like a boring vision of life that is informed precisely by this finishing moment, right? That is informed by death. We accept death as something that no longer should, uh, makes us anxious uh, in any kind of way or uh, bother us intellectually, philosophically, religiously, you know, however. Uh, and that this very acceptance of death as the sheer event of our life actually flattens the whole vision of the human life into this non-problematic cycle. Right? Uh, Kozhev called it like a return to animality, right? but because he himself was a Hegelian, although a very perverted one, and I don't buy into his interpretation of Hegel, right? he, uh, he believed that this return to animality is obviously on a higher level, which means that we've been conscious of death all this time. And the struggle with that actually made human being into a human being, right? It was an anthropogenic factor. But now, once we've built this wonderful civilization with technology, medicine, and so on, we can just as well stop, right? We can just as well give up of being so mobilized against death and finally accept it. So they finished the whole like, historical cycle of men rebelling against the sheer facts of nature, right? End its cycle, accept the verdict, accept its necessity, and completely change our lifestyle, right? Into, well, what he calls after Nietzsche, the last man, right? The last man who, as Nietzsche says, invented the happiness because all they care about is actually to like, roll more or less pleasurably from cradle to grave. Right? <laughs> and, and this vision is totally accepted by Kozhev, endorsed by Kozhev. And if you read any uh, modern 
philosophers coming from the biopolitical angle, you know, starting with late Foucault, right? but also Agamben, but also Negri, but also Esposito, right? Just to mention, just mention a few uh, of the so-called Italian theory. You'll see that actually this this Kojevian acceptance, which turns human life into finitude proper, that is without any other ambition apart from fulfilling this cycle. Right? It's actually a very strong notion. It's a very. It's now, I think, I would say, <coughs> dominant and mostly operative notion of human life. Right? So. My idea is simply to try to oppose this boring, uneventful, you know, animal-like uh, vision of human finitude with a project which does not really want to sort of re-establish uh, uh, the belief in the immortal life. Something I personally don't share, so I can't pretend that this is the true alternative. Uh, and what I'm trying to do is, again, simply rethink another finitude, that is a finitude which nonetheless somehow takes in the idea of infinity and transforms it. That is, makes human life open indefinite in a positive sense of the word, which I just try to explain here, right? Pos potentially infinitely rich with the potentiality of this neighborly love, precisely as Rosenzweig sees it. And the life so full and twists and turns and these resourceful peripateas that it will never be easily reducible to the simple cycle of becoming and perishing. Hmm? And Rosenzweig is a very important inspiration for me here because he, uh, even in the Star of Redemption, uh, where in a way he inaugurates this project of alternative finitude, he draws on the resources of Judaism which he understands as the religion of the finite life, right? So for him, uh, Judaism may be, Judaism or not just rabbinic Judaism, it's like you know, the, the whole tradition of Jewish thinking may actually be a very important source of inspiration, not just for the Jews, but for all of us, right? In the 20th and 21st century, because it actually offers an alternative vision of the finitude not reductive, not doomed, not thanatic, not simply physiological, not reduced to a cycle, uh, but somehow shot through by the arrow of infinity, right? to use Levinas' words. Um, it does not pro propose or promise any personal immortality. That's the neoplatonic development then adopted by Christianity also adopted by the rabbinic Judaism in the second century. But in a way, it never somehow took strong roots in the Jewish faith or religion. It is never really that much oriented towards personal immortality, although it deals with infinity all the time. Right? So for me, Rosenzweig is a very important source of inspiration because uh, well, I can see how he, drawing upon the sources of Judaism, develops in a very interesting way Hegel's intuition <coughs> that human life is indeed a living contradiction which needs to be somehow resolved and reconciled. That's our task as living individuals, right? We are contradictions, living, walking contradictions between the infinite and the finite. And this is a kind of task that singularizes us, that makes us separate individuals, because the way we resolve this task is inescapably individual. Thank you very much. Um, are there, well, I can see several questions. I suppose, why not go from this side of the room across? Thank you. 
guests. Um, thank you for your um, very beautiful talk. I'd just like to make a comment from a, a Christian perspective. For a Christian religion is, of course, very indebted to the Jewish religion as elder brothers and sisters in the faith. And as the Christian attitude to death is not, uh, it has a different attitude than the secular um, attitude um, because of the resurrection that we mm -hmm. believe in Jesus Christ from the dead. But this is not, it's not just that we believe in life after death. It's also a sign that love is stronger than death. And this is, um, enables us to live in a relationship with Jesus Christ in this life now. And because Jesus is God, this is like a relation with the infinite. And we also speak of Jesus as the word or the logos. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just wanted to, uh, thought I'd comment on that and if, if there were any um, resonances with your position. Thank you. I, well, obviously, what can I say? I mean, you know, this is your perspective, which is the Christian perspective, which will always have difficulties with this affirmation of the finite life. And I'm absolutely aware of it. Um, but you see, you said love is stronger than death. And it is such a frequent misreading of the biblical line that when the Christians read uh, this line from the Song of Songs, right, they see stronger instead of strong immediately, right? They always have the tendency to read as love is stronger than death. Whereas in original, it says more modestly, love strong as death. Right? <coughs> so that's, in a nutshell, the difference between Judaism and Christianity, which you just very beautifully pointed to, right? Immediately, right? That from the Jewish perspective, love is only as strong as death, which means that love operates in the conditions of the finite life. It cannot conquer death, but it can complicate its verdict and delay it. It can uh, uh, rule it out, so to say, from the center of our life, but it's an ongoing struggle. Mm? And Rosenzweig shows it beautifully, right? That is precisely the love that is a transposition of the infinite into the finite, right? Only a loving life is the life aspiring to infinity. Whereas Christians obviously see stronger as death, which immediately indicates resurrection, the promise of the immortal life. Uh, something we don't agree with, right? We, or we not necessarily agree with, but we still right, believe that you can have an infinity within your finite life, unimpaired, without any compromises, right? And it does not have to be necessarily realized in the form of personal immortality. Yes, thank you. It's um, a reading of the Christian understanding. Uh, perhaps one needs a slightly different nuance here because it's not as if Christianity says, um, you know, we'll just get through this life and then we've got the real life when death's been conquered. It's because this life is also finite and complete. And it's beautifully summed up as C.S. Lewis. Um, in this life, we write a title page of what we are to be in eternity. But the title page is written. Mm -hmm. So there's this finitude as well. So, so there's this other reading, slightly different nuance. Um, but actually, that wasn't my main question. Um, I really want to ask about the speech act, because you mentioned about love um, and the speech act. And I'm starting to think, well, what do you mean by the speech act? Because speech acts involving persons... Um, could be uh, it could be a utilitarian exchange of information, or it could be a kind of a speech act with a person. Um, and the model I'm thinking of here is sort of liturgy or something like that, where you, it's really it's the union is is more like a sharing, a, a shared togetherness, not so much uh, uh, here's some information, blop, and back again. Mm -hmm. So what does he, what, what does he um, uh, how does he conceive of this speech act? Thank you. Well. <clears throat> It will probably uh, require a long explanation, but uh, Rosenzweig is one, well, is actually the founder of the uh, dialogic philosophy. So in his, before Buber, right, it's Rosenzweig who lays the foundation for the dialogique, which is the living 
exchange between the individuals precisely in the act of speech, right? That, that the speech, the act of speech is addressing the other, okay? So it is not like sharing the same meaning within the lit liturgy which you just mentioned, right? It's not uh, just simply talking. It is using the language in a living, practical, concrete kind of way when you right now, just now, address the other. Hmm? And you ad the, the addressing here is not just formal. You address the other by actually, you make him come alive, right, in the dialogue. Which means that this address has to be really strong, really focused. Rosenzweig calls it enlivening, hmm? belabung. And actually he is so st deeply steeped in German Romanticism that he believes that properly addressed inorganic things also come alive. You know? He's a bit like Wordsworth, right? In this kind of a belief that if you uh, write a poem about the storm, right? You revealed the soul of the storm, right? that normal daily perception can never see. Right? So it's this belabong, it's this principle of universal animation that is attached to the task of speech. Right? It's a messianic task for Rosenzweig because you know, in this hard address, so to say, when you, you know, really call the other and make him come alive, even harass him right, to come alive in this living dialogue, uh, but it's also for Rosens, like the act of love. They're actually indistinguishable. Mm? So calling upon the other, recognizing the other, making him come alive, you know, even if it's sometimes a violent act of address, that's all, the, that's all the part of this love, uh, the function of which is actually to pace off the whole orbit of creation, but always concretely, that is, without any shortcuts or safety net of any general categories. Right? Philosophy uses general categories. But for Rosenzweig, the living speech is strictly singular. Its regulative ideal is naming. Okay, so in the, for instance, in a poetic speech, that's how he understands the poets, and I think it's actually a very good theory of poetry. The poets basically name things. We think that they describe them, but in fact they do not describe them. They just name them, right, in the irreducible singularity. Love singularizes, makes things individual, makes come alive in their individuality, right? And that's why the love has to proceed from glides, right, from one neighbor to the other. It can never take uh, a recourse to general philosophical abstraction. Does it answer your question in any way? It greatly enriches the question. It enriches the question, but, but that's, that, that, that's a long... It, it's a, I think that, uh, in a way, both Rosenzweig and Bobe, uh take the roots, I mean, in the sort of the, the dialogique, the whole you know, conception of the, uh, of the dialogue. It's all rooted in the romantic ideas of poetic speech, right? That it's actually a kind of a poetry made as a kind of a model for the speech act. I think uh, Samuel Hughes and then... Uh, well, this has been partly addressed in your answer to Ralph's question, but I thought I might <coughs> ask you to expand on one point. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if you could say um, to what extent and uh, in which respects do you think that how these problems appear to Europeans has been altered by um, the receding of our religious heritage, for many Europeans anyway, and how that's changed how these problems seem to us? Well, <clears throat> I think that already Schopenhauer 
right, is the, is the philosopher who diagnoses the receding belief in Christian dogmas and the kind of a non-obviousness, non-evidence, right, of, for instance, the belief in personal immortality. So it is already the half of the 19th century. And if you think about what happened next after Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, the whole German Lebens philosophy, and then eventually Heidegger, who crowns the whole development, you'll see that this like perception right, of waning of the uh, fundamental core of the Christian belief, which is the belief in resurrection and personal immortality, that it's been waning right, in the main corpus of philosophy, of Western philosophy, already from the 19th century onwards. Even when you read Hegel, and Hegel is still, he declares to be a good Lutheran and, you know, the immaculate Christian philosopher. But even Hegel does not believe in personal immortality any longer. He only believes that in the finite life, us reflecting the glory of the infinite, and these are his own words, but he thinks that we are just finite spirits. Spirits, okay, that is the fracture of the eternal spirit, right? The, sh the sparks and shards of it, but finite, finite, inescapably finite. So this philosophical rediscovery of finitude, right? Uh, despite Christianity, the official Christianity, is something that actually coincides with modernity. The first inklings of the finitude, the finitude which, which is, you know, not just the passing or disappearing moment, to use the Hegelian word, but the, but the steady, essential characteristics of human life appear as early as the beginning of modernity. Already Descartes utters these doubts, right? Hegel only reinforces them. Uh, Schopenhauer basically rejects the whole of Christianity precisely on the basis of the implausibility of personal immortality. And then there is just a downslide, right? Nietzsche practically ver reverts back to the pagan tragic paradigm, right? And Heidegger, with his declaration of finitude, like the Endlichkeit, as the essential attribute of human life, just basically seals the whole development, right? So, but the question is not that simple because, you know, in case of Descartes, of Hegel, you wouldn't call them non-Christian thinkers, right? Not at all. Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, Heidegger, definitely post-Christian, right? There is no quarrel about that. But Hegel, certainly not, right? Certainly not. So, it may well may be that modernity, philosophical modernity, Hegel especially, I think he is a fascinating case of that, offers a kind of a new version of Christianity which focuses on the finite, right, on the finite life, practically gives up on the discussion of personal immortality, but still maintains to be Christian. Perhaps. It is an interesting development, you know, worth looking at, you know, from, for the theologians as well. Right? For, Hegel calls it the religion of our era, right? He calls it a religion. Phenomenology of the spirit is a program of a new religion for modernity. That's how Hegel understands it. And it may be a hetero heterodox Christianity, right? Like, Cyril Oregon, right, called it, but it's still Christianity, right? So it is a possible version of it. Well, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, Arlen, I think, is next in line. Thank you for that presentation. Um, it was very startling for me to hear because you started off with 
what I think is perhaps op- an opposite conception of, of death to one I've been fiddling around with, and then ended up doing something that was really quite similar to um, where I was going. So I, I want to ask you about some of the intuitions that inform your conception of death. I mean, mm-hmm. to begin with, you know, you, you start off with, say, what might be observations about death. Um, you characterized it as an absolute limit, as an event horizon, um, and as something that is constantly and essentially involved in, ev- in, our, in our living. It's, it's not only something that happens when we die biologically once. It's, it happens all the time. Um, but then your it's stance... It's not me, it's Heidegger. Yeah, yes, I've, I just meant that that's, that's how you started. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but your stance toward death was... Uh, it, it was a matter of having to sort of shore up something that, that, that can, can be apart from death and can be meaningful or at least something significant that doesn't just get sort of sucked up by it. But then, as you as you went on, you, um, you ended up combining love and indeterminacy in sort of very interesting ways. And, um, well, I think that was the startling part for me, because um, if one treats death as something like, poetically speaking, the that which is given up when you love, then the stance toward death changes completely and then it's quite easy to start speaking about living as a matter of the intermingling of love and indeterminacy. But when you start off with death as a poria mm-hmm. um, and end up going the same way, I'd, I'd like to understand that a bit better. Well, I juxtapose Rosenzweig with Heidegger precisely to show that for Rosenzweig, death is never the... Um, the lesson, uh, something like the ultimate meaning that has to penetrate uh, the middle of our life. Uh, uh, These are all Heidegger's characterization of death, which I think come from the earlier uh, reaction to this rediscovery of finitude, right? That that if if you look at what happens with, you know, even Hegel, then Schopenhauer, then Nietzsche, up to Heidegger, they think that it is absolutely natural to think about human finitude in terms of, well, what is the finis? What is the end, right? That is what makes the end, the death. So the first seemingly natural view of the human finite life is somehow overdetermined by the fact of its ending. The death becomes the defining moment of human life and because it becomes such an important defining moment, it begins to penetrate into the middle of human life. And this is precisely the kind of development that needs to be stopped. Rosenzweig says that this is not the only way in which we can conceive of the finite life. Hannah Arendt, who works with Heidegger, Right, and is more or less, I mean, is a younger colleague of Rosenzweig, but they work in a very similar like conditions, the Weimar era, Heidegger's philosophy becoming the kind of a new fashion. She writes her doctorate with Heidegger, but at the same time, she protests very strongly about Heideggerian notion of the finitude. She thinks that finite life may just as well be conceived as having a definite beginning, right? Not the end, the beginning. Birth. Hmm? This is also a marker of the finite life. Why should death be so overestimated, right? Why not thinking about the finitude from the other end, right? Or the beginning, the birth, right? And she coins her concept of nativism. Rosenzweig is concerned about the middle of life, right? For Hannah Arendt, it's just a simple reversal. Heidegger is all about the ending. I'm all about the beginning, right? The new life coming into being, the birth. But Rosenzweig has a different idea. It's a concentration, the focus on the middle of life, what he called Mitten des Lebens. And it's 
indeterminacy. It's indefinity. Like equally distant from birth, equally distant from death, uh, not determined by any of these poles. Right? It is, in a way, a thing of non essence, in pure transition, right? jumping from one thing to another, hmm? having no essential characteristics, but it is not bad at all. Right? For Rosenzweig, it may just as well be seen as the way in which love operates. When you are selfless, you don't focus, you know, on your own qualities, right? You give yourself away in the passage from one neighbor to another neighbor. Hmm? So in this indeterminacy, this indefinity is actually the infinity, right? the infinity of the uh, of love. Mm. And then you can have a finite life. Don't think about, you don't have to think about birth, you don't have to think about death. You just focus on this one thing. Not even focus, because you can't really focus, right? It's inessential, so you cannot focus, but you just let it happen, right? The way it develops, as a story develops. Sounds like a view where you might have to be careful not to start thinking too much about death, that is. Oh, no, no, that's precisely what, what, what Rosenzweig wants to prevent, right? You, you, no, you shouldn't think too much about death. The moment you start thinking too much about it, it will take over your life. Right? So. Well, we'll have one last question, and I believe we have, unless we've had several, but I haven't missed, have I? We might have to have two more. <laughs> okay, just a quick one. I'm really out of my depth here, but do we not have a problem perhaps in present day Christianity with our conception of God's omniscience? Um, if God is completely omnis omniscient, then perhaps it might be said that man's role vis a vis God is merely ornamental. Um, and by that I mean that in God's omnis omniscience, from what little I know of Heidegger, there would be no room for the Ungrund or Heidegger's mm -hmm. very mystical area that kind of excludes God. Um, can we, by looking at this, and also perhaps I'm reading a bit of uh, Eppard Jungel at the moment, who tries to give man a purpose in allowing God to be revealed through him, um, can we perhaps uh, uh, start to take a different look at God's omniscience in order to give man a meaningful role um, because currently I think there is a bit of a problem in Christianity in that man's role is is not really defined easily. It's, uh, it's hard to see how it has a real purpose. Um, sorry, that's fairly <laughs> fairly, fairly um, obscure question. But it's not, no, no, it's not <laughs> obscure because it's a... Uh... In, in one of these sort of eternal questions in Christian theology, mm. you know, what, 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 what's the role of human being, the human's free will, mm. free thinking, and if, if God is om omnipotent, omniscient, and mm. uh, all provident, right? Yes, so basically yes. oversees the whole yes, of creation. Exactly. This right? is a problem. Yeah. Well, I would say, but. I'm not the most orthodox thinker mm. in, you know, either Judaism or Christianity. <laughs> but I would say that, you know, we have to somehow, in order to secure any kind of a free will or a meaningful position uh, for human life or basically for all creaturely things, mm -hmm. we'll have to, we will have to go for some kind of the idea of divine withdrawal. Yes, yes, yes. Which again is very modern. Mm. And uh, it's, it's not just Hegel, right? But before Hegel, it's, it's the whole Kabbalah, mm -hmm. which actually fil is filtrated uh, via the Christian Kabbalah into German idealism. Mm. The whole idea of Tintum, the God's radical withdrawal which basically leaves the creation to its own devices, mm. right? And then, obviously, the role of the human being becomes decisive mm. and incredibly important mm -hmm. because there is no 
theological supervision mm -hmm. of this enterprise called creation, mm -hmm. right? It is completely uh, on its own. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would, I would say that, that theologically speaking, the only solution for your mm -hmm. problem is that we have to somehow deal with the idea of the Tsum as withdrawal. Yes, it can be a hard concept. <laughs> Also, we're not being mean to someone who's been waiting for us. Okay. Well, I, I think we must draw things to a close now, although, of course, we could go on much longer. Uh, there will be ten minutes whilst you might be able to catch Professor Biello Robson if you do have a burning question, or you can also uh, help yourself to some more refreshments as we start to clear up. But before that, let's please give a very uh, a warm thank you to Professor Biello Robson. Thank you.